Welcome back to Black Cat Crypto Club. It has been a crazy week. Uh, just last Sunday, we crashed down to 49,000 and change on Bitcoin. And now we're back up trading in the 60s. Um, and just a bunch of things going on with the economy and uh, the Japanese yen and carry trade. And so I've got Sam Halioris here again with me. And so welcome, Sam. Welcome back to the channel. Good morning. Jake. Good morning. Um, so I, I've known you for a while and you, you, before I knew you, you lived in Hong Kong. And I believe you have uh, some experience, quite a bit of experience and knowledge about uh, the markets and, um, you know, the, the carry trade and, and Asian markets and whatnot. Um, so can you just kind of give us an explanation of, of how you see the carry trade or what the carry trade is? Because I, I watched the, the yen, um, kind of nosedive against the dollar and everybody was really worried that they were going to start uh, selling U.S. treasuries and that was going to tank the dollar. Um, and instead, what they did was they started hiking rates in Japan, which is completely opposite of what everybody else is doing in the world. We're all getting ready to start cutting rates and, and Japan's going the other way. So... I knew about all of that stuff, but I didn't know about the carry trade. I'm just kind of learning about that now. So why don't you kind of give an, uh, us an expl explanation of what the carry trade is and, and all of that. Thanks, Drake. Um, really, in a nutshell, the carry trade is an example of interest arbitrage, right? Right. If, if you can imagine a world where you can borrow money in one currency at an extremely low interest rate, then move that money that you've borrowed into a different currency, which is in a higher interest rate environment. Boom, you've got the essentials of a carry trade. Um, in, in the Western markets right now, the cycle that we're in is peaking on interest rates, which means that you can charge more interest for money that you loan and you can earn more interest on money that you already have you want to invest so the situation where japan is in a different spot on their cycle with respect to interest rates creates an opportunity for arbitrage trading on currencies well and um, it's the arbitrage is is specific to currencies but if you're just an investor the way I understand it is you can you can either borrow in the dollar or whatever currency, but against the dollar, if you borrow in yen, essentially you were getting an interest rate five and a half percent less because I think they were at zero percent, right? Yes. So if you're an Very investor and you're looking to leverage and and take a loan and invest in something, you know, stocks or crypto you you know your best bet is to take this low interest rate loan and either buy your stocks that you're investing in with that money or crypto or whatever it, it may be so um it's not just technically you know you're you're borrowing in and buying the dollar by any means from my understanding anyway that's exactly correct once you borrow money at a zero interest rate, the yen, right? you can do anything you want with that money. You could buy yen at 0%. Uh, 
and invest in U.S. securities, right? You would get about what a three and a half percent guaranteed right there, risk free, three and a half percent, or put but it in a money market account. Exactly, and money money exactly. market accounts were getting like five five and a half percent or whatever. Yes, can you imagine having a billion dollars? borrow a billion dollars in yen and get money market accounts in interest rates on the money but you don't have to keep it in currencies you could invest those borrowed yen in real estate you could invest those borrowed yen in the stock market anywhere in the world or in with respect to our little niche of the world, um, you could buy cryptocurrencies. You could buy Bitcoin. You can borrow at zero percent in the yen and put that money into Bitcoin. Yeah. So where did it all go wrong? Um, you know, I Whoa. guess technically, technically, um, when central banks raise their rates that strengthens that currency correct so when when rates go up the strength of you know the dollar or the yen goes up and i believe you know the the bank the bank of japan started raising rates and the strength of the yen started really just skyrocketing versus the dollar and other you know bitcoin was trading sideways so it was gaining a lot of strength against cryptocurrencies and that's where the leverage got really wiped out is that i i don't know explain that uh mechanic to me Okay, if you look at the reason why central banks have the interest rate where they do, um, it goes ultimately back to the strength of that economy with respect to the cycles that economies experience. So when an economy is extremely strong, you can endure, if you will, higher interest rates. And higher interest rates make it possible to earn more money, really. You, because you're borrowing low in every case, your plan is to borrow low and then earn a percentage on your costs of borrowing. So if your cost of borrowing is high, say 5%, well, if you want a 30% profit, 30% of 5% is more than 30% of 0%. So if you're getting money at 0% and you want a 30% profit, it's harder to do than if you're borrowing money at 5% and you expect a 30% profit. Right. So when the United States had our most recent crash, you've got to remember that the Fed rate was zero or near zero for five, six, seven years. That tells you that the U.S. economy is weak and the Fed is giving away money. That makes it hard to make money in that economy. It's an indication that it is hard to make money in that economy. So, what puts an end to that 0% Fed rate is ultimately always the same. It's inflationary concerns, right? Well, we're getting inflation. We have to cut back the money supply by raising rates. Now, all of that is relatively mundane. But what makes it interesting is when an economy that's tied so closely to the United States economy, like Japan, it gets interesting when those two economies are not in lockstep on their macro cycle. Right. So the U.S. Fed, just in the last year and a half, two years, 
well, a little bit more than that, started raising rates to reduce inflation, but Japan stayed at a zero, near zero Fed rate, right? That created the conditions for what recently happened. When Japan started to raise their rates at the same time that the United States is in a part of a cycle where we're going to be lowering rates, right? Some people who had been borrowing the yen suddenly realized that that party was over slash about to be over. So they started converting assets into cash, Drake. They started converting to, assets into cash. So they People, could get out of that leverage, out of their loans in the yen. Uh, yes. Which, yeah, makes sense. So when you need cash, you know, you can trash the dollar, you can trash the yen, you can trash Bitcoin if you want. But, you know, that's not when, smart. Uh, don't don't trash Bitcoin. OK, never mind that part. <laughs> never works out. Cut. Cut. <laughs> Look, the, the point is that when times really get tough, people go back to cash. And so when Japan raise their rates just a micro amount really a minuscule amount of the reserve rate in japan from their central bank it signaled more than what it did it signaled a new cycle in japan and uncertainty leads to hoarding what you've got in its base or primal form which is currency actual fed currency so people who had leveraged to buy stocks leveraged the yen interest arbitrage versus the u.s dollar people who had leveraged taken advantage of that arbitrage opportunity people sold their stocks and they sold their cryptos well when this this started happening it really started over the weekend last weekend, right? And uh, so the way I perceive it was Bitcoin, especially last Sunday, took one of the worst beatings that we've seen in, in quite a while. Uh, and that's because this carry trade started unwinding and crypto and Bitcoin was the only thing you could sell on a Sunday. And I think mm -hmm. what we saw was Monday came and the stock market and everything took their hits Monday and we started seeing Bitcoin kind of normalize. That's right. I remember um, it was about midnight on Sunday and I just picked up my phone and I was like, whoa, Drake. <laughs> uh, I know yeah, I was... I was sitting up in bed watching, watching it. And, uh, you know, it's one of those days that makes you sick, but you know, yeah. you have the, you have it. It happens all the time in crypto. So I'm a yeah, little more used to it, but it still hurts my stomach. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, well, Japan being, a, a ahead, right. As the Japanese market started to unfold on their Monday morning, it was still right. late Sunday here. And like you said, crypto is the only thing you could sell. So. At least here in the U.S., while markets were still, it was still Sunday, right? So. Yeah. Now, Drake, <laughs> you mentioned something. Just the way that you just described your experience of that Sunday evening, Sunday night for us is yeah. so poignant, and it segues me to another subject. Okay. It's, Drake, it's, it's that sick feeling you get in the pit of your gut when something threatens what you love. And that is is an experience we've been having recently also with the SEC 
the SEC has been threatening something that we love too, Drake. It's not just international monetary policy and interest arbitrage and right. So you want to hit the, the SEC? SEC? <laughs> yeah. Let's let's talk about the something. SEC. So yeah, the, the extra the big thing right now, you know, you've got Donald Trump saying that he's going to fire Gary Gensler day one. Um, and we've seen this week, we've seen uh, the Harris campaign kind of reaching out uh, to crypto firms and I don't know, placating or pandering. I don't know what it is, but there's not. You know, she's still in a position of power where it seems like if she wanted to do something, maybe she could make it happen. But there's not a lot of action happening. Um, but but my thought is on the SEC, when it comes to Gary Gensler, it, just firing Gen Gary Gensler alone is cathartic, I think, for the entire Bitcoin community. But it's not necessarily that alone doesn't necessarily make things positive. Like Jay Clayton, the previous SEC chair, was hostile against Bitcoin and crypto as well. You know, right as he was exiting, uh, he, he's the one that initiated the suit against XRP, which we've just seen conclude this week as well. But... My point is, is that, you know, you can talk about firing Gary Gensler and everybody's going to love it, but who you put in is going to really be the thing that makes the difference. And I don't know if there's many people that I really trust even going in. Hester Pierce is like, you know, a lot of people call her crypto mom and she's on the board of the SEC and really super friendly, but also you got to remember going back previous to Gary Gensler, Gensler was very pro Bitcoin. He taught blockchain technology at MIT, and then he got in and lost all of his ethics and started doing, you know, bidding uh, for Elizabeth Warren and the, the anti-crypto army. So... Yeah. I just don't see firing Gary Gensler as necessarily a positive thing. It, it really depends on who comes in and if they continue to be uh, pro crypto after they get in that seat. So, yeah, a Gensler firing is not the solution, Drake. Right. It's not the solution. It certainly would be happy times and it would be indicative that a strategic solution was in the mix. Maybe. I, I yeah, it, <laughs> it, it could be indicative. Maybe, maybe right. not. They could, it depends on who else they put in. But remember that that's tactical. That is come and go in the world of strategic um, economic policy. What the real solution would be would be exactly what Trump is proposing. The positive involvement of the federal government in not just Bitcoin, but the crypto world in general. I think a strategic U.S. investment in crypto, irregardless of who's heading the SEC or who's heading the Federal Reserve, right? These kind of strategic yeah. movements. And back to your point about what is Harris doing? Is she placating? Is she really what she's doing, Drake, is damage control. And right. she's doing it on the cheap. Because you know what? Doing damage control on the cheap, you know what that means. It's talk. Talk, talk, talk. Right. Talk, talk, well, talk, 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 and talk, some talk. might say that uh, that Trump is basically doing the same thing. You know, and I mean, 
he all but came out. I mean, he he came out and said it. You know, we're going to be nice to you at least until the election, right? So, That's you know, a good all, all of the things, all of the things that Trump says is really great too. But man, I just don't know if you can really expect that. I mean, I don't know if. I mean, he's never going to need our votes again if he wins. That's true. Dre, and so let's get. There's, in my mind, there's no really real thing tying him to to following through on, on all of these promises. In, I don't know. Let, but we've also, you know, it's like, what do you do? Because we've obviously seen you know, immense hostility from the current administration as well. So I don't know. It's a toss for me. Right. Right. Talk is cheap. So let's get down to indicators of real strategy by the government, the U S government in this market. The real indicator of strategy will be the disposition of the Silk Road Bitcoin. That is 15 billion US dollars worth of Bitcoin. That's the ball. Keep your eye on the ball. Whatever happens with that Bitcoin will not be talk. That, that will be action. That's and true. Whoever, whoever does whatever with that Bitcoin will be playing their hand and revealing their strategy. And we did see that move right after Trump said he wanted to put it in a national strategic reserve. So, yeah, if, uh, mm -hmm. if the current administration sells that, I mean, all bets are off. They're, they're completely hostile and, and remain hostile um in my opinion but um so anyways getting back i want to so for about the last at least year and a half or two years um the only real bear case that i've seen that has any teeth for bitcoin has been uh this case of like a major recession in our economy. And I think we're starting to maybe see um, the economy moving towards that if we're not in a recession already. But the way I see it, we've got like four really, you know, possibilities as far as recession and how Bitcoin reacts. Um, I think the first one is we, we go into a recession and Bitcoin does exactly the same as as stocks and goes down and has its own recession just in line which we have kind of seen a, a bit of a correlation to to that kind of thing with bitcoin and and the general stock market um the second would be that we have we go into a recession and bitcoin becomes that flight to quality or fl flight to safety, like Larry Fink from BlackRock is saying. So it goes back to your point that, you know, in, in times of uncertainty, people flock to cash, right? So what, yeah, one big thing that Larry Fink has been saying um, since, since they've been going after the Bitcoin ETF with BlackRock is that Bitcoin is that same flight to safety. So if that narrative takes off and people really start buying into that narrative, we could, we could see a recession, but Bitcoin could, could continue up. Uh, so that's the second, second scenario I see the third uh, would be that we go into a recession and the Fed prints our way out, you know, lowers, lowers rates and just starts printing money. And we have like a really short dip into, into a recession or a bear market and, and then start flying away because of all the 
liquidity that's you know new new money being printed into the the system which is is good for markets but we're going to see prolonged inflation if they do that so it's not good for for people generally um and i think the fourth the fourth narrative out there is that we're we're not in we're not going into a recession we're going to have that soft landing and uh you know the the economy is strong you know fed pair, fed chair pal uh, I keep saying that, you know, the, the labor market and the economy isn't weak right now. We're just normalizing. So we've got kind of those four uh, narratives as far as a re recession goes. What are what's your opinion there? What are what do you think is most most likely? Well, it really depends on who wins this election, Drake. Let's. Be serious for a minute. We are in the last hundred day countdown to an event that is truly strategic. This is not a typical four year election. And you have to really characterize these last few weeks and months leading into the recession as a period where you are treading water. There is huge unknown in the outcome of the election, and there's huge unknowns in the period of time leading up to the election. We have wars going on, right? And we have economies moving fast. So right now is truly not a time to be picking winners. Right now is a time to be observing what happens. and. So then with respect to outcomes, speculating about outcomes during this period, the, the two major factors are housing prices and money supply, employment slash money supply. Look, money supply, money circulating equals employment and employment equals housing prices. and People's hugest source of wealth is investment in real estate at an individual level. When you have a hell off home equity line of credit, when you have a property that you own that becomes more valuable, that is the number one derivative of that is cash flow. It's money to invest. So the housing market, the, the character of a potential recession with respect to housing prices will be your indicator for the crypto and the stock markets both. If you get an economic downturn that's driven by, okay, a little bit of a dollar circulation pinch that leads to some unemployment problems that's pretty negative people don't have a lot of money to invest that's kind of a bad thing if you get a recession that starts turning over towards depression which means that the job and money problems are enough to really dig into home equity numbers once you start seeing a real estate crash that means everybody in the world just lost their job. You know, if 5% of people lose their job, that's bad. But yeah. if housing prices go down 5%, that means everybody in the entire country just lost 5% of what they're worth, their net worth. So the key indicator, Drake, the bedrock, of our economy is housing prices. If you see housing prices start to come down, that means everybody in America is broke. When, when you lose value in your house, you sell investments. So, Interesting. you know, I'm not, 
I'm not <laughs> predicting a future outcome. What I'm doing is describing indicators to watch. You can tick along and say, okay, unemployment is going up a little bit. Okay, that's fine. You can tick along and say interest rates are changing. Money supply is changing. That's fine. But when you tick along and you start to see housing prices coming down, that's a devastating um, development for an investment sector. And Drake, crypto is an investment sector. And the right. bedrock the bedrock of people's net worth is their house. It's not their stock portfolio. It's not their crypto portfolio. It's their house. So keep your eye on real estate prices. So when you say all that, the, the thing that comes to mind is, you know, BlackRock again, like, and how powerful do you think BlackRock really is? Because listen, we've, we've all seen, um, housing prices just skyrocket the last few years, but we've also seen hedge funds and big investment companies like BlackRock just swallowing up that real estate. So usually uh, the way I think of it is usually when we do see crashes like this, it's, it's disproportionately it disproportionately affects the lower and middle classes and the rich get richer typically in my mind. Um, and, but I, with a housing crash like that, I think that, you know, where we've seen BlackRock and these companies just swallowing up massive amounts of real estate, I think they would be pretty affected by that as well. And so my, my, my thought is, if BlackRock really is as powerful as people think, do they, do they even allow that to happen? Fascinating question, Drake. Remember, the tide rises all boats and the tide lowers all boats. And right now, BlackRock seems to be in the same boat as us real estate investors i'm a real estate investor you're a real estate investor our single hugest asset and hugest source of our wealth um so here's a potential way to think about the blackrock involvement in real estate with respect to the macro economy and another trend that affects real estate prices is global warming the Green New Deal. You've got to look at who owns the real estate in the United States. When a player like BlackRock and other major institutional investors come in and start owning residential real estate, that's very unusual. It's, it's a very unusual happening in the United States. And the way I think about it is when I see major players talking about global warming and residential real estate, the writing is on the wall that people with six or 7,000 square foot houses, they're talking about two individuals, a man and woman that live in a 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 square foot house. This is no good in with through the lens, the meta lens of global warming. I think a trend that you're going to see in the decades ahead is downsizing of housing because of global warming and the Green New Deal. So in order to displace a lot of people from huge residential properties that are really decadent if you think about it you need a trend and you need player the player is institutional investment in residential real estate where they've never been before i'm talking about houses you've you've seen real estate investment trusts before but that's commercial 
right? That's huge multifamily developments, office buildings, retail, right? When you see a player like BlackRock, super high profile, moving into residential in a new way through the lens and against the backdrop of global warming, it really makes me feel like, Drake, that you are going to see a residential housing crisis where a company like BlackRock is there to pick up the pieces and buy some of this gluttonous, decadent real estate in, in the cause for global warming. Yeah. Green New Deal. That's, that's, man, we could go on with that for a while. So do you think we see a housing crash that forces, uh, you know, these people that are living you know, in extravagant houses out of those. And we see that, um, that type of real estate kind of die off and people are more equalized in their housing. Bingo. That's exactly what I see. The meta play, the meta play Drake is right now. I know people, I know read, uh, People very close to me that live in 5,000 to 6,000 square foot houses, a retired man and woman, just two people, they are paying $400 a month for air conditioning. They are paying $600 a month to water their lawn. They are paying $300 a month to, for lawn care and landscaping. Man. And so look strategically if you see the world as dying because of the energy use for residential real estate then you you need someone to come in and be available to buy that real estate when the time is right but you've got to get these excuse my french but you've got to get these oldies out of their mansions drake we have millions of 5,000 square foot houses with two people living in them. And then right across town, you've got two bedroom apartments with six or seven or eight people, two or three families living in two bedroom apartments. So if, if the subject of the conversation is BlackRock and why are they getting into residential in a new way, I switch to the lens of global warming and I look for an event that will quadruple BlackRock's holding in real estate, not on a financial basis, but on a square footage basis. BlackRock wants to save the world from global warming by crashing 5,000 square foot mansions and buying them up at the bottom. Yeah, that's, man, that's fascinating. I think we could go on that for an entire episode, honestly. Um, but I do have some things I got to get on, get on to today. So we, I'm going to move on to our last uh, thing that we had. So I want to jump over to this uh, Reuters article. Um, and it says market sell-off will slow, stretch, spread, investors predict. And this kind of goes back to the, the carry trade. Um, and what they're saying um, in this first paragraph, it just says, this week's huge sell-off in global markets triggered by an unwinding of the yen-funded trades is far from over and could eventually spread to credit markets, impair some banks, and possibly hurt the US dollar fund uh, managers say. So here's the big question here, because I don't think you were in crypto um, last year when we saw uh, uh, that slew of bank failures, but last, it was last spring or last early summer, summer 2023, we saw Silicon Valley um, and several other banks go under. And what we saw was 
it, it was almost the first time that Bitcoin did trade like a flight quality. Um, because what we saw was Bitcoin, you know, really showed that strength in being an alternative to banking. And so these banks were failing and Bitcoin just like skyrocketed at the time. Um, so it goes back to that thought that you said, you know, about in times of uncertainty, people go to the, the dollar. But in, in the case of bank failures, people really start to look towards getting out of the traditional system, in my opinion, and going into crypto. So if, if what this Reuters um, article is saying is true, we start seeing banks, uh, you know, start hurting, maybe start going under. And also the U.S. dollar getting hurt normally um, outside of this, this yen um, carry trade. When the, when the U.S. dollar goes down, typically we see an increase in price in dollars to Bitcoin, right? Like naturally. So... Yeah. I don't know. What are your thoughts on on this? Because it's saying, you know, this is not good if this if this continues to sell off. But if it's hurting banks and the U.S. dollar, is there any way that that really buoys the crypto market is my my question to you? Uh, right. Banks make money on transactions. Banks are a transaction business. So the speed of money moving and the volume of money moving is what determines a bank's viability. Which is what you saw in the Japanese yen carry trade recent little bump. That's stopping money moving. People were borrowing yen for free and then moving it to a different market to invest it. Well, the transaction, the middleman is the bank. The bank is making money, 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 money on just that flow of money. The bank is getting their percentage. So when you see that stop, boom, now banks are in trouble. Banks are in trouble because money is not moving around the world. So. What the banks will do is look for a different way to make money on transactions. They need a different cash cow, so to speak. They need a different type of transaction moving. So while the yen carry trade and the new um, Japanese reserve rate will maybe hurt banks in the short term because that money is not moving, the banks will find a new place to put money and move money. And you just have to wonder what that will be, what will be their new kind of loophole that they look to exploit. Hopefully for us, it's the U.S. cycle is coming down on rates, which will inspire more borrowing in the U.S. market, more borrowing U.S. dollars. Instead of people borrowing yen to invest it, if U.S. rates come down, then people will borrow U.S. dollars and try to invest it in the United States or elsewhere. And that will help the U.S. banks and the U.S. economy in general. So how does that affect Bitcoin? Because when, when rates come down, the, the strength of the dollar goes down, correct? Yeah. So can we expect Bitcoin to climb against the dollar and and this is the first cycle that we have um that banks can technically really own bitcoin specifically um and ethereum now with the etf so another question is is you know, you, you said they're going to look at another way to move money. Is yeah. that escape hatch crypto for them now? Exactly, Drake. 
that is exactly the kind of thinking and that is exactly the kind of question that that leads to big answers. And I certainly hope the answer is yes. And you can see a path forward through that lens where as the U.S. Rate, rates come down and the U.S. dollar starts to flow more. Again, the tide rises all boats. People who borrow money in U.S. dollars and have an opportunity to earn profits on that money, well, now they need a place to put their profits. And that is investments. You can invest in real estate. You can invest in stocks. You can invest in bonds. You can invest in cryptocurrencies. So as long as money is flowing, and housing prices are stable, you will see all asset classes rewarded, including crypto. Then the meta trend is the federal attitude towards crypto, right? With Which goes back to the SEC and um, the Federal Reserve and the National Crypto um, Endowment or Reserve, right? But the, the economic and the political in lockstep will either be strategically good or bad for crypto. And with the yin little interest arbitrage carry trade issue in the context of the U.S. interest rates coming down and banks looking for new transactions to make money on, hopefully those new transactions will be in the U.S. dollars, keeping the U.S. economy strong and housing prices protected, freeing up money for investment in crypto and other asset classes, all within a context of an SEC chair and a Federal Reserve chair and, 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 and a political administration in the United States that is friendly to crypto. And that's our dream scenario, Drake. However, for the next 100 days, we literally are in tread your water and speculate. It's crazy. You know, two, two or three years ago, I would have never thought we would have had these tailwinds that we're seeing, you know, Bitcoin being a, a huge national uh, talking point for the election and uh, Bitcoin ETFs and all, all of this. I mean, I just, I honestly don't see anything long term that just signals anything but major upside in in crypto but sam i we could go on for probably the entire day just talking um one of these times when i have you on we're gonna have to touch on ai uh because both you and i were at utah state doing you know philosophy that was heavily focused on AI. So I'd love to pick your brain about what you're thinking about all of the, the recent developments on AI sometime. But thank you for uh, joining me today. And I look forward to our next conversation. You're welcome, Drake. Thank you for having me. It's always fun to chat. And uh, I'll see you next time on the Black Cat Crypto Club. <laughs> Thanks. And as always, thank you guys for taking the time out of your day and joining us here for, for the, the uh, episode today. I always appreciate you guys taking time out of your day and, and watching these videos. If you guys like the video, do the likey thing, hit the thumbs up, uh, subscribe, all of those good things. And as always, guys, remember uh, this month I am um kind of showcasing the zend final a uh, farm and sanctuary this is their website here it's uh the zend tx.org um 
you can see right here this is their logo but i do have uh the link to this this page in the descriptions of all of my videos this month so if you guys have a dollar or two to to help these guys help these animals out it's always appreciated on my end um so look for that link in the description it's again if you just want to type it into your phone it's vzendtx.org always appreciated on my end um and guys thank you again and i'll see you in the next video